Sorry. The member from Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, and Westdale. Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Yogi Berra once said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. That's good advice, as forks in the road often lead to important personal transitions. Ian Deans understood this better than most. A family man, firefighter, professional soccer player, NDP, MPP, and house leader, professor, part-time MBA student, he did graduate, leadership candidate, NDP, MP, and federal house leader, and chair of the Federal Public Service Staff Relations Board. The list goes on. No matter what Ian did, he would blaze a trail. His mother, Margaret, and father, Bob, inspired him. His wife, June, was his rock. The whole Dean's clan were always supportive of Ian because politics was a broad family affair. As smart and as charismatic and articulate as he was, in my opinion, next to Stephen Lewis, Ian was probably the most articulate member of the Ontario Legislative Assembly. Ian was, down deep, a very plain and simple man, a man who saw injustice and fought to end it, who saw pain and tried to heal it, who fought for anyone and everyone with a just cause. He loved his constituents and they loved him back. They may not have always agreed with Ian, but they trusted him, believing he always had their best interest at heart. Could it be said of all of us? Simply put, Ian gave those who held nothing sacred something to believe in. I first met Ian Deans at my own fork in the road in the early 1970s when I undertook a graduate school internship with him here at Queen's Park. Ian was the best professor I ever studied with, and the person who most inspired me to a life of public service. I helped organize a couple of his campaigns, which in hindsight was fairly easy considering his overwhelming popularity as a politician. We became lifelong friends. For a couple of years, I did constituency work with Ian. <clears throat> Good training, probably, right? No constituents. <laughs> No constituency office, no cell phones, no computers, little support staff. I think there was one for every six MPPs back then. But gosh, did he get things done. I remember spending entire days in the Legislative Assembly Library researching special topics for Ian. Once I prepared material on the Warble Fly Act. Now, Jeff would understand what that is, and Ernie, and John, but probably a few others. Um, so I prepared the material, and Ian then gave a very well-received speech on the topic. He thanked me for my hard work, and kiddingly, even sarcastically, said, you never know when your new knowledge of the Warble Fly Act might come in handy. Neither of us knew at the time he was speaking to a future Minister of Agriculture and Food. <laughs> Ian excelled at holding the government's feet to the fire at question period. He had a secret strategy, and I'm going to reveal it probably for the first time. You see, back in those days, the Hamilton Spectator published twice a day. You may remember this, Andrea. At 3 a.m. and 3 p.m. June, his wife of many years, or I would pick up the early morning paper and read portions of it to Ian on the way to Queen's Park. He would then be quick on his feet, asking the government tough questions about the very emerging issues that reporters were preparing articles on for the afternoon or next day paper. Needless to say, Ian appeared, and rightly so, to be on top of everything. Ian once suggested to me that the single greatest ability any person in public service can offer is the gift of availability. He worked harder than anyone I've ever met in politics. He would frequently represent his constituents at various board hearings, including the OMB, and he would represent them better than any lawyer ever could. Ian was as strong an advocate for organized labor as he was a relentless supporter of individual rights, including his own. A bit of a libertarian, Ian fiercely debated the seatbelt legislation when it was first passed. At one point, he simply refused to wear his seatbelt. As a friend, I finally had to refuse to travel with him to Queen's Park, and was he? 
he did it up, which he did. But boy, was he ticked at me. <laughs> Speaker, I want to extend my condolences to Ian's family, especially his children, <coughs> Trish, Ian, Jeff, and Megan, and his sister Janice. I know firsthand just how often the spouse and children of politicians pay the price for a life dedicated to public service. We thank you for sharing your husband, father, brother, grandfather with us and with all the people of Ontario. Thanks largely to you, Ian Deans has left a legacy of difference making. Speaker, despite the fact that Parkinson's robbed Ian of his spirit and ability to communicate over much of the last decade, Ian, who anyone who knew him would attest, continued as best he could to stay engaged with his family and his community. Speaker, I will always remember Ian Deans with fondness and thankfulness for his friendship, mentorship, and the great life he lived. I want to end with the words of a good friend Ian and I shared, the late, great Reverend Dr. Tommy Douglas who once said, interestingly, at the funeral of a friend, this, and I quote, if instead of flowers, we could plant a beautiful thought in the heart of a friend, that would be to give as the angels give. Throughout his life, Ian Deans gave as the angels give. We give thanks for a life well lived. Rest in peace, buddy. Thank you, Speaker.